It's episode 40. On the pod with me today is Bobby Tandy, founder and CEO of XR Games. Our conversation starts around making sure you select a career that you're passionate about. We explore the future of gaming from VR and AR to XR and gaming on Facebook's Oculus Quest platform. It turns out Facebook have over 10,000 staff working on VR and AR. We also discuss the best ways to market your game. Please enjoy the episode and thanks for being a fab listener. Support me by subscribing and telling your friends. Welcome to the Johnny Ross Audio Experience. I'm Johnny Ross, founder and digital marketing strategist of Fleet Marketing. Each podcast, I'll be bringing you an expert to inspire you, to give you some great business growth takeaways, and to get you thinking about marketing and the bigger picture of how businesses can improve, adapt, and grow. I look forward to sharing this with you on each podcast. So here we go. Hi and welcome to another live Q&A. Welcome to the Johnny Ross Audio Experience on the podcast as well. We are live streaming on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, I've got uh, Bobby Thandy with me today. How are you? I'm very well, Johnny, and yourself? Yeah, I am very good indeed. Uh, we're well, going to be talking about uh, gaming. We're going to be talking about um, VR, AR, XR, XR games, but also XR gaming. Uh, and... Um, uh, interestingly, just in the green room just then, uh, we were talking about how to uh, how you could market a game. So if you have developed a game and you're looking to market it, uh, I'm very interested in getting to understand how you market games. Uh, so uh, that's something that we're going to get into. Um, if you are watching uh, live, then feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'd be interested in taking them, so please do use the chat function. Uh, and if you're listening... Thanks for being here, uh, and uh, and please do enjoy. So, uh, Bobby, uh, tell me, you uh, founded uh, XR Games back in 2017. In um, that's when you incorporated. Um, what I want to go right back. Why gaming? How did you get into gaming? And was it just to sort of fulfil a hobby, uh, something that you were doing as a, a teenager? Um, good question. Um, actually, the, the Commodore Amiga um, actually launched with the Batman pack, <coughs> excuse me, when I was 13 years old. Um, and I came from a poor background. So my parents, I managed to persuade my parents to fork out a lot of money. Um, and it came with the Commodore Amiga, the Batman pack, and one game. And uh, I remember my parents, my dad specifically saying, that's a lot. You can't afford, we can't afford to buy you any more games. Uh, so I played that game, and then I was like, you know, what am I going to do now? Um, and um, I did the only thing I could do, which was um, figure out how to hack the games um, and make copies of the games and sell the copies to my friends. Um, <laughs> and what that meant is, you know, after six months, a year of doing this, um, I'd got it to a stage where I was getting early access to games before they'd even be promoted, before they'd be marketed and before they're even in the magazines. Um, so what I found uh, was great from for myself was kind of getting hold, having early access to these games and then deconstructing the games and figuring out what were the best selling points. And then I'd have to go and kind of present this and pitch it to my friends to encourage them to get a buy a game when they hadn't even heard of it on the market yet. Um, but that was a lot of fun. I was kind of making enough, a bit of money that was re being reinvested to get more games. And my catalog of games was uh, significantly increasing. Um, so I kind of aligned my kind of passion um, with uh, my income, which was uh, fantastic at the time. Um, that said, you know, when I was a teenager, young teenager, um, I didn't have any friends in the industry. Um, I didn't even know how to get in the industry. And I always kind of just deemed working in the games industry akin to wanting to become an actor or a sports star. It's just something so far-fetched, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, so... Uh, forever maintained my love of gaming and passion for gaming. Um, but went to university, did a BA honors business studies degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do after university. I went into marketing um, and research and kind of um, found an affinity with kind of analyzing big data um, and writing code to do kind of conjoint analysis, max diff analysis and helping clients kind of understand 
the different attributes of a new product and which attribute was most impactful to the customer and the impact it might have on price. So did some really cool and brilliant jobs, uh, but then I kind of moved from head of data analysis um, to kind of head of sales, because it would be me who would have to go in, present to the clients and kind of sell them on our big uh, data analysis tools. Um, and then I also moved into a client management relationship as well. So I kind of had three pillars, coding, analysis, client management and sales. Um, and it just so happened that on my daughter's first birthday, um, she sat on my lap and uh, I'm kind of speaking to her. She didn't understand what I'm saying. And I'm like, you know what? I want to give you the best life possible. Um, and that means I need to get a higher paying job. And I also need to align my passion with my work because my belief is when you do align your passion with your work, it, you know, it, it sounds corny, but it generally feels like you're not actually getting up to go to work. You're getting up to do what you love doing. Um, and I said that to my one-year-old daughter, and as crazy as it sounds, I've got two text messages within 10 minutes of saying that from two different friends inviting me to come and work with them. One was a job in the financial services industry, and the other one was a job in the game in the games industry working for a game studio. So you can imagine which one I took. Um, so yeah, I was working for Dubit Limited in Leeds, 70-person um, game studio focused on making games for uh, children um, and young adults, um, and went in as their head of business development. Um, it's quite funny, actually, in the interview, they'd mentioned they'd try to hire someone on a big six-figure salary um, with great experience, but it hadn't quite worked out. So they wanted to kind of come to the other end of the spectrum and get someone with uh, coding skills, sales skills, and client management skills, and try and train them up to become um, the BD person that they uh, aspire to have. And unfortunately, it just went from strength to strength. Um, the, I think the pivotal moment in my career from transitioning from head of business development to uh, a more wider uh, role that encompassed different facets of game development was when I'd spend maybe one to two years closing a deal. Um, I remember closing the DreamWorks deal in particular, um, having closed it and trying to pass the executive producer at DreamWorks over to the production team. Um, and he's like, no way, Bobby. It's like, you know, we've been working on this deal for over 12 months. Um, I've come to know you, come to like you. You're now going to be my executive producer and you're going to make sure the project's delivered on time, on budget, and it's of a high standard. And that became the first one. And then that started happening more and more um, before the owners of Dubit, uh, Ian Dalfway and Matthew Warniford, had promoted me to be the VP of digital in charge of a team of 50. And that just kind of went from strength to strength. W was that, the, were they gutted when you left? Uh, good question. I actually got um, head-hunted by EA to lead one of their studios. And I'd gone through this six-month um, process, kind of meeting more and more senior managers, presenting a 90-day plan. And only once I'd received the offer from EA did I sit down with Ian and Matthew um, and say, look, you know, you're my really good friends. I've really enjoyed this role, the opportunity you've afforded me. You know, we were traveling all over the globe, working with some brilliant clients, making great games, and having an absolute blast. I said, I don't want to leave. I genuinely don't. But look at this offer. It's, you know, it's a crazy offer on the table and life changing for me and my family. Um, but Ian and Matthew, you know, very clever, very wise. And they knew I'd always wanted my own game studio. And I'd yeah. always uh, thought I would do that after EA um, because the experience I would have gained there would obviously help me kind of raise funding and kind of build the team. Um, but they're like, let's fast track you. And rather than going to EA, you know, here's 100K seed capital. You can hire your favorite team and we'll incubate you here at Dubit um, and let's see where you can get to. Um, so they provided a fantastic platform from which I could safely grow within the, within the walls of Dubit until we were able to spread our wings and fly. And, you know, here we are, we've raised VC funding. We've just re recently released our third title, um, we're at you know 30 plus employees and in this beautiful studio here as well. So yeah, fingers crossed we continue going from strength to strength. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's pretty impressive stuff. That that first deal must have been quite amazing with DreamWorks. Uh, how did that yeah. make, you, make you feel? It was the first um, deal uh, that I had done with a Hollywood film studio. Um, so you know, very exciting to work with big IP. You know, you're on calls with. Uh, Hollywood film execs, 
Um, but because of the time zone difference, you know, you're working crazy hours. Um, but, you know, I never mind a trip to L.A., that's for sure. I mean, you've just mentioned that, actually, and it's interesting. So is is gaming I, i'm trying to be careful what i say here uh and, and not not uh not not put the uk down too much uh but <laughs> for, for for big gaming and big and and being in the right places have you got to work with someone like the states or or, or being uk alone is 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 that ever going to uh, achieve anything like what the states can achieve um, it depends on the type of game you're making. So, you know, the, the, the UK games industry is thriving. You know, you've got Team 17 in Wakefield. We're based in Leeds. You've got Team 17 in Wakefield um, with, you know, a, a billion-dollar market cap last time I looked. Um, uh, Sumo down in uh, Sheffield, uh, you know, $600 million market cap when I last looked. Um, a 1,000 staff as well as, you know, other huge studios uh, in the UK, Code Sync up in Newcastle, just thinking now of VR, AR studios, uh, Fisprite over by Liverpool. Um, there's, you know, lots of studios in the UK, um, lots of studios doing great work. And, you know, if you're an indie studio working on your own original IP, there's no need for you to kind of partner with um, US IP holders. Um, but if you're, you know, you want to establish a relationship with PlayStation, for example, you know, PlayStation have fantastic offices in London, so no need to go abroad. Okay. Um, maybe Microsoft and Oculus more so. Um, I mean, XI Games' thesis has always been we want to work with world-famous IPs because we believe by working with a world-famous IP, um, you know, the, the cachet that a Zombieland IP has helps elevate XI Games standing in the community. Yeah. Um, and later down the line, we'll do our own original IP, which would, wouldn't involve as much travel. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I can completely relate, and I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening uh, can too, uh, you know, doing something that you're passionate uh, in is really important. I think uh, not only uh, is it more enjoyable, but, um, you know, I think you put more in, uh, you get more out, uh, and... Um, uh, so, so I completely, I completely get that, um, and in fact, I probably learned that lesson a bit too, uh, you know, quite late on. Uh, and uh, but, How do you but mean, then, well, I think I stuck. I think I was in a, a job that I wasn't passionate about for for too long, uh, and right. uh, you know, it took me it took me quite a, a little while to to move on uh, and find something that I was extremely passionate about. Uh, so, Kudos to you for doing it. Um, I always find it really interesting, especially for the people listening, is understanding what that trigger was. I mean, everyone has their own passions, but you know, for yeah, me, yeah. Was getting married and then having a daughter who's one years old, then me saying, you know, I, I want to give you a higher, I want the best life possible. I want a higher paying job. I was yeah. like, do that. And for me to have fun, it had to align with my passion. So that was my, tr we're very interested to understand what yours was. Yeah, I think, I think it was more about just uh, sort of the, the next big step in, in my life. And there was, you know, changing circumstances uh, at home and, it, you know, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was the next big step that I wanted to make. And, uh, and, and um, I, I don't regret uh, the job I was in at all. Um, I just, uh, in hindsight, uh, wish I'd moved sooner. Uh, and, um, you know, because, because you, you, um, as I said, if it's something that you're really passionate about, you get way more out of it. So, yeah. Definitely. It's all too easy to get yourself comfortable, right? And it's like, I might not love my job, but I'm comfortable what I'm doing and I've got a nice lifestyle. It, it takes a lot, I think, to kind of move into a different lane and go into the unknown because it is scary. It can be nervous. It can be terrifying. But you start beginning to find your feet and then you grow in confidence with each little win. Totally. Uh, whilst we're on this, I think it's probably a good time because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was you've got some really good values within your company um, sure. and and those have uh, been instilled uh, early on which uh, helps you innovate uh, and, uh, and and keep that uh, close-knit team you, you say there's now uh, 30 of you which is which is fabulous um, I think the values do you want to do you want to go through what they are um, for sure, we can. Uh, uh, we did a, a big exercise amongst uh, management and then the wider company itself. And what we wanted to kind of distill was, you know, why did you come to work, um, and what is it that brings you joy at work? 
Um, and then we kind of distilled it down to uh, six different values. And we can kind of touch on some of them. So, for example, um, you know, fun. You, you need to bring your passion um, for games for the industry to work. And if you're not having fun at work, it's going to show in your work. Um, so, you know, when we uh, hire people, for example, we kind of look at our six values. So it's kind of fun, imagination, quality, inspiration, elevation, and trust. We can kind of touch on these in a moment. But when we are interviewing people, we're kind of grading is a strong word, but kind of making note of where they rank on these values. and. Are they passionate about the VR industry? Take, for example, one example. Uh, take, uh, for example, uh, Rosie Summers. She, she applied for an animation post at XR Games. And when her CV came in, it was like the most perfect CV in terms of not only does she love animation, um, but she's crazy passionate about VR. And, you know, she attends events. She does live painting in VR. Uh, she gets paid by the likes of BBC and Google and YouTube to go and go to events and talk about VR and perform in VR. Um, and all the posts are about VR. And she says, you know, when she's not working as an animator, she's spending her time in VR. And this is what was coming through the CV. I was like, really? And then I started looking at her social media posts, and it was just phenomenal. You know, she's 10,000 followers on Twitter now. And the, her output of VR artwork just screams passion for the industry, screams passion for VR. And when you can hire people who are just this passionate about the industry, they're only going to be a huge asset to your company itself. Um, and that was just VR. For her actual career, the uh, chosen uh, career path at XR Games being an animator, you know, we set her a test where she had to animate an old man walking with a walking stick, and she absolutely nailed it. Um, and in the interview process, like, can you just unpack your process here? Um, and, you know, by asking a simple question, you get to really understand how a creative thinks. And, and she's like, you know, I tried to imagine what it was like for an old person to animate, but it just I couldn't get it quite right. Then I started watching videos of how an old man would walk with a walking stick. But I couldn't really get into it. So, you know, I decided to take off my socks and get some drawing pins and sellotape them, pins to the skin up and then put a sock back on and then get a walking stick and now I'd walk and I knew I couldn't put any pressure on my foot because you know I'd get loads of drawing pins going into my foot um, and then by embodying that experience and then filming it then she knew how to animate the person so you know when we talk about fun and passion it's really uh, interesting to kind of ask deep questions to see how people think about stuff how they approach problems um, so yeah having these values it's, it was great to understand what motivates staff at work um, and we can not only have that on our website, but also apply it for future hires. Well, uh, it would seem that CM, who's watching on LinkedIn right now, he's put, wow, Bobby, are you guys hiring? Uh, I'd love to work at a company like yours. So uh, oh, there we go. Uh, absolutely. Please go to xrgains.io. Our open positions are on there. Um, but that's another interesting point, Johnny. I'm not sure what it is, but when we advertise, for example, for a junior game designer, We've got over 950 applicants, which is crazy. Wow. Just, uh, we recently put an advert for a chief operating officer and received over 140 applicants. Wow. What this means is when we're reviewing that number of CVs, and yes, someone sits there and reviews all the CVs, you're kind of looking at, you know, did they get great grades? Did they win awards at university? Have they won awards since then? What do they do in addition to their current role? And when you've got over 900 people to choose from, the game designer that we did hire, and there's a blog series coming out about this uh, shortly, it shows you what that process looked like in terms of identifying what are the key attributes we're interested in. But then not only do they have to be an A-plus on game design, the, you know, the, the chosen candidate was also a writer. They could draw, they could animate, and they had this kind of all-rounded skill set as well as thinking creatively and um, writing very clearly. Um, but it just means it feels as though we can kind of hire from the best of the best of the people that apply to us. Um, but yes, it's a fascinating space to be in, that's for sure. It, well, that's amazing, uh, the Ooh, numbers. I that think you, you're frozen. Oh, you're back. That's amazing, the, uh, <laughs> the numbers that you are talking about there. That's, uh, that's crazy. Uh, very interesting indeed. Definitely. So you've had some... Uh, I mean, uh, having only been going for uh, just a handful of years so far, um, you've got some great successes. 
Uh, there's the uh, Zombieland uh, versus Headshot Fever game, uh, which was with Sony Picture. Uh, th this is with o uh, Oculus, is it? Uh, so Zombieland VR, uh, Headshot Fever, um, it's a game we've made in collaboration with our partner, Sony Pictures. Sony Pictures, uh, they sorry. Made the movie. Yeah, they obviously made the movie. They own the IP. Um, in terms of distribution and the platforms it's on at the moment, yes, it's on the Oculus uh, store, uh, available to play via an Oculus Quest 1 headset, a Quest 2 headset, or a Rift headset, and it's going to be going multi-platform oh. soon. Um, interestingly to note, we've got a big update landing tomorrow with more content, upgraded visuals, and some more bug fixes. So very excited to see how uh, the audience reacts to that tomorrow. And the other one uh, that you also got a deal on was Angry Birds, uh, and that was for the PlayStation. Angry Birds Under Pressure VR for the PlayStation. That was uh, before Zombieland, wasn't it? That's correct. That was the, launched in August 2019. Um, it was delivered on time, on budget, and to critical acclaim. And that was working with Rovio, who owned the IP, obviously, for Angry Birds, and Sony Pictures, who were making the movie. Um, but no, it's a fantastic project for us to work. And, you know, it's a multiplayer game. Um, the reason we designed it to be multiplayer, you know, a number of people felt when they were in a VR headset, in a social setting, they'd put on the VR headset, and then everyone else became isolated to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another problem I really wanted to solve for was when I was at home, you know, my wife's playing Candy Crush, um, the eldest is playing Fortnite and the Nintendo Switch, the youngest and YouTube kids, and I'm doing work emails on my phone. I was like, what the hell? We're all together in the same room. But we're actually alone together. Um, so when thinking about the Angry Birds game we were going to make, I wanted it to be a cooperative game whereby we could all work together. Um, so one person puts on the headset, and three other people can use the DualShock controllers and the TV screen. Now we're all together in the same experience. And because it's a cooperative game, we're all working towards the same goal. So it involves teamwork, it involves talking to each other and blaming each other when things go wrong. Um, and the, the, the thing that brought me the greatest joy on that project was regardless of where we played, and we were on tour with PlayStation in Montreal, in Los Angeles, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and in Chile, uh, we had thousands of people play the game, and by the second level, they would all be uh, bursting out laughing and seeing the game create laughter, create fun, and create moments where people can bond together was absolutely fantastic. You, you were talking, uh, uh, or, or sorry, I was talking earlier about the uh, the future mm -hmm. of um, AR and VR and, and and potentially XR being the the combination of the two. Um, you you you're a firm believer that this is only going to get bigger and uh, and in fact you were saying that there's ten thousand staff at Facebook working on this. Correct. Um, yeah, this is, that's 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 crazy. That's billions and billions of dollars, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, if we just wind back a little bit, you know, every fifteen years there's a new tech center. We went from mainframes to PC, to web, to smartphones, what's next? Um, and the big tech firms are, as you say, spending billions, believing the next computing platform will be XR glasses. Uh, Matt Zuckerberg has been uh, very passionate about it becoming the next computing platform. And that's why, you know, it's widely reported 10,000 staff, a fifth of his entire org organ organization is working on AR and VR. And that's why the Quest 2 is leading the charge. It's an all-in-one headset inside out tracking it doesn't need a powerful computer to power it there's no wires um it's you know you're seconds away from a fantastic from a fantastic vr experience um but uh, so that's facebook apple uh have, again thousands of staff they've got a rumored apple apple glasses that will be coming out next year um, and that's gonna i believe uh, help move the entire industry forward to go more mainstream um, you know, Microsoft, Google, um, Niantic, also big believers in AR, Snap, they've already released their AR uh, spectacles. So, you know, all the big tech firms, some have made announcements, some haven't, but they all seem to be betting big that it will be going mainstream um, and it will become the next computing platform. The reason XR Games exists is because we also believe in that. So whether it's five or six or seven years out, we definitely see um, us moving towards uh, a future where it does become mainstream and you know the XR glasses should be coming down to 
a, a form factor this size. Um, you can imagine it being in AR mode through the day where you've kind of got digital images overlaid you. So, you know, we talk, we're talking right now, uh, my eye and only I may see kind of above you your most recent LinkedIn post that could help get relevant, uh, up-to-date contextual information to aid this conversation and make it more interesting, although it is very interesting already, Jody. Um, and then in the future, and then, you know, you get home and you might want some downtime and play some games. You can imagine you press a button and it kind of goes into a VR mode. And that's the kind of future we're hoping for, and that's the kind of future the big tech firms are working towards. I'm, I'm hopeful and imagining that you don't even need to press a button. <laughs> yeah, it should be. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point, actually, um, because Facebook <laughs> and Elon Musk are working on various neural interface uh, mechanisms whereby you, know, you don't need controllers, you don't even need to move your hands, you'll just use your mind to make things happen in the virtual space. Uh, and that's a future that excites me very much. And, and when you're developing a game, how how much have you got to bear all this in mind uh, to make it future proof? Uh, or do you end up investing on a load of technology that that actually can't be used in the game right now? I'm not sure. I, I you know I, maybe I'm off on a tangent here, but no, no, it's a, a very good question. You know, when we launched, started thinking about Zombieland back in kind of. October, October 2019, when we first started looking at the project, you know, you're having to make very big decisions of when this game comes out, um, whether it's December 2020, which is what we originally thought it would be, but we got a, offered a, uh, a, a good um, uh, slot with Oculus in terms of promotion. That meant we kind of pushed the release out a little bit further. But, you know, you're having to make bets when you start a project in terms of what will be the most popular platform when the game comes out. You, you don't have all the information. Um, you only have, uh, you know, half the information that you'd like. And you're kind of placing a bet on which headset's going to be most popular in the future. Um, thankfully, we got that right uh, in terms of the Oculus Quest 2 headset selling absolute gangbusters at the moment. But when we made that decision, only the Quest 1 had come out. Um, but, you know, seeing the commitment Facebook is making to this industry uh, makes it a safer bet. We are going multi-platform. So we'll be on IT, we'll be on Pico, we'll be on Vive, we'll be on Windows Mixed Reality, we'll be on Valve Index and all that's happening right now. But being a small indie studio, you know, you can, uh, I feel you can launch on one platform first and then do all the other platforms later on, whereas the bigger studios can just sim ship and be on every headset on day one. We're not quite at that stage, but look forward to being at that stage. Um, yeah. and it's also worth noting, you know, PlayStation, the PlayStation 5's come out. Um, they've announced a PSVR 2 coming out, but it probably won't be till next year, Christmas. Um, but again, you know, you need to be aware of the cycles, the consoles and the headsets are coming out um, to help educate you on where you should place your bet. You mentioned uh, Windows Mixed Media just then. Where are, where are Microsoft in all of this? Are they are they, are they going to get left behind finally, or <laughs> are they going to find are they going to find a way back up? Um, I think they're too big to be left behind in some regards. So, for example, they have the Hololens too. It's a fantastic AR headset, um, but due to the expense, it's kind of you know, primarily sold to enterprise clients. So, whether you're in the construction industry, you may be a surgeon, etc., and you need an overlay of the organ that you're kind of operating on um and so that you know that they are very far ahead in terms of ar headsets in terms of vr they've helped create vr headsets and they kind of work with their partners so for example um they work with hp and they've created they've helped uh, work with part by partnering with hp they've created the hp reverb g2 headset um as well as a, a multitude of other headsets and these headsets plug into your uh, computer, uh, probably a Microsoft computer, um, and you can access um, VR games that way. However, Microsoft also have a console called the Xbox. That console at the moment doesn't support VR. There's rumors in the future that it will, but at the moment they, they haven't created a VR headset that will plug in directly to their Xbox console, whereas PlayStation have. And you know, when I last saw some reported figures of PlayStation, what the, the PSVR one headset, um, had sold over 5 million units. So PlayStation have a significant jump on Xbox in this regard. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the coming years. Yeah, well, that that's the bit that surprises me, that they've not moved forward on Xbox. Uh, but I guess uh, I guess they will. Um, and, um, yeah, watch this space, I guess. So 
um, I wanted to just talk to you about the uh, marketing. How do you go about marketing a game? I mean, firstly, who plays your games? What's what's the the demographic, and uh, is there a particular age category? Is there a particular uh, 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 persona that uh, that fits really well? What's the um, good question? In the first instance, it was predominantly early adopters buying the VR headsets and gamers. Um, you know, for myself, when I first tried a VR headset, it was like, holy smoke, I've now stepped into the experience. I'm no longer passively playing, um, looking on a screen. I can step into the experience, and it's a completely new medium and a new way to experience games. So in the first instance, um, it was early adopters, and it was gamers. But what the Quest 2 headset is doing now, it's kind of becoming more mainstream. It, you know, we're they're selling millions of units. So more and more people are buying it. But from the people uh, in my circle, they are mainly gamers. And the type of game we've created in Zombieland VR, it's a, a light gun arcade shooter game, um, easy to pick up, but requires a high skill level to perform really well. Um, we believe you know, that the audience does skew two males who are able to afford a, a Quest 2 headset. Um, but, you know, the Quest 2 headset is, uh, you can be, as long as you're kind of 13 above, you can play it. And that's the kind of age recommendation on it. But our game, because of the violence and the, the, the language, uh, it's, you know, appropriate only for adults. Um, so I, I believe it's adults skewing towards uh, males. Um, in terms of thinking about the marketing plan, you know, very good question. Um, you know, the, first and foremost, you need to ensure you've made a great game that's fun, addictive, and people love playing. That's kind of 50% of the jigsaw puzzle uh, resolved. And then the other 50% is reaching your intended target audience. Um, and there's an array of ways you can do that. Securing feature placement on a platform such as the Oculus Store is, you know, first and foremost, by far the best way to get uh, eyeballs onto your product. Um, in addition to that, you can help support it in an array of ways, working with influencers. So, you know, we worked with a whole number of influencers who would get early access to the game, create content, and that would get launched, you know, a couple of days before. They would put it on their uh, socials a couple of days before launch, and that got us millions and millions and millions of views. And then we'd also work with companies such as Keymailer, and they have a... Uh, a, a, a a database of over 24,000 influencers and we've kind of provide the people interested with a key so then you get loads of uh, free influencers playing your game because they want to get share content with their audience um that's another key asset and then you know social media in terms of facebook ads google ads um uh, instagram ads youtube ads and uh, ensuring it's very contextual in terms of you know someone who's got a vr headset has a quest to um has bought games recently and kind of identifying those kinds of people. Um, but with you being in marketing yourself, it'd be great to get your thoughts in terms of what you find works well. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, yeah, what you're confirming to me is that it is that even though it's a game, uh, it still needs that entire mix of marketing, uh, lots of different channels uh, to, I guess, get the message across a number of times because people typically need to see things seven times before they uh, make a purchase. Um, and uh, and so it's just confirming that really. And uh, in fact, whilst you were just talking then, you talked about uh, feature placement on the Oculus Store. Is there a whole um, algorithm to get higher in the store as well? And I, I guess that's based on number of purchases, reviews, downloads, uh, etc um as you say there's an algorithm at work there um and uh yeah you know, I, I i i'm unaware of how the algorithm works but you know the game's selling well reviewing well so you know i think we have like almost uh, 280 uh, plus um user reviews rating the game 4.4 out of 5 so that's fantastic to see yeah. i'm sure that's an ad weight when the algorithm comes across zombieland to understand you know where it should be positioned in the store yeah. Um, where the game's selling well and whether you're supporting it. So, you know, tomorrow we've got the big update, new levels, new visual upgrades. That's all going to help improve our odds of being promoted on the store tomorrow. And, and, and actually, if you've produced a game that's uh, platform-specific, 
for example, the Oculus, uh, then I guess that's easier from a uh, targeting point of view, especially for things like Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you could, uh, uh, I would have thought, target to people that are interested in the Oculus or certainly uh, uh, have some connection with it. So, so I, 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 that becomes a bit more interesting in terms of being able to target. I think that's quite good. Uh, hundred percent. And, you know, even when you're targeting, you still, you know, you come up with some copy, you come up with some call to action and an image and a video. Um, but that's one. Uh, and, you know, you have to do A-B testing. So we'll have like maybe, you know, 20, 30 different ads with different call to actions, with different combinations. And it is just continually A-B testing to understand what works well and what drives the lowest cost per install. And even when you find that, you know, in a couple of days, it'll change. So you're constantly having to stay on top of it to understand what works best. I, if you look at some of the uh, popular games with the younger generation and you look at uh, Minecraft and um, uh, the name's completely gone out of my head for just a moment. Uh, it was totally Roblox. Fortnite. Fortnite, okay, uh, yeah. or include Roblox in there as well. Why not? Um, uh, one of the things that I find is is probably the biggest marketing channel is the influencers on YouTube. So the gamers uh, on YouTube that are just you know playing this twenty four seven and have hundreds of thousands of followers, etc., uh, etc. Et Has that been uh, you know is that is that a creme de la creme to try and get to that sort of level where you've got uh, YouTube gamers playing the game and and, uh, and and telling their fans this is what to do. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, my day is all about what the reporters wrote about the game and buying PlayStation magazines and seeing what they get. You know, the reviewers are saying, and that was kind of do or die for the game studio. And you know, the, 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 those reporters, I'm sure they live very lavish lifestyles, getting invited out for fancy dinners and lunches, etc. Uh, but most definitely, there's been a shift now to the content creators, the influencers. Yeah. They wield the power. Um, and if you can get them on board and they're having fun with your game, that'll be evidence in the video that they make. Um, and then hopefully, you know, their audience will resonate with that, watch the content, and then buy your game. What's the, uh, the future for XR Games? What's the next game that you're working on? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and is it, you know, is it going to be... Are you going to be able to play it on your glasses? <laughs> uh, good questions. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I've got to say stum about that. But when we're in a position to announce, 100%, uh, we're looking forward to uh, showcasing to the world is, what we're working on. Is there a timeline? Um, without, 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 you know, are we talking months, years? Are we talking... Are we uh, it'll take a minute, that's for sure. But, you know, we will have games coming out this year and next year. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, you know... Following the success of Zombieland, it's been fantastic to see the number of work for hire opportunities increase. Um, we're kind of bringing on, signing more projects. Um, more investors are interested in investing in XR games. Um, the number of people applying for our roles is increasing. Um, everything's just kind of leveling up the number of projects, the budget of the projects, the investment deals. Um, exciting times. I mean, we can't miss this bit because uh, we. I noted that the the company is called XR Games. What you've told me is that uh, whether uh, the term XR was out prior or or during the naming of the company, it wasn't really very big. But actually, it's now an emerging term. Uh, so you're sort of going from VR AR to XR gaming. Um, so you know, kudos to you for naming a company on uh, a term that was uh, that that's emerged um, and. Uh, uh, and, and becomes very handy when someone's Googling XR games. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's brilliant. Uh, thank you. And, you know, uh, I do have to allow, you know, Lady Luck to play her magic as well, in the sense that when we were thinking about the name of the game, uh, the name of the studio, I wanted something very clear. So you know, you're on the phone and, you, you know, you, um, it'd be like XR games, and hopefully they just get it straight away and it'll be easy to remember. Um, but when we were kind of getting down to two letters, what should those two letters be? Um, we went through an array of different options, um, and then we kind of settled on extended reality. We felt like, you know, VR, AR was an extension of your actual reality, um, and that's where we kind of uh, came to an X and an R. But then when we were designing the logo, well, actually, the V and the A kind of brought together, looks like this, as oh, this is like, you know, it fits really well. Um, but it was only after we'd named the company XR Games 
did the uh, VR industry, AI industry begin to coin the phrase XR? And did that kind of become widely accepted? Uh, so I feel very fortunate that happened. And uh, yes, it'll, I'm sure it'll help our SEO ranking, that's for sure. Excellent. Um, brilliant, fascinating conversation. Uh, Bobby, if people wanted to uh, contact you, um, there's obviously the website which you mentioned. Just remind me the website. Sure. Uh, www.xrgames.io. .io. And where, whereabouts do you personally hang out online the most? On social um, media? Are you on any of them? Yeah, we're on. Uh, I'm on Twitter um, at Bobby Tandy, B O B B Y T H A N D I. Um, Instagram at Bobby Tandy, um, and LinkedIn. If you search for Bobby Tandy XR Games, you'll see me on there as well. Feel free to reach out and connect. Absolutely. Brilliant. Fantastic. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, you've really opened my mind up uh, in the whole VR and AR gaming world. Uh, and uh, very interesting on the marketing side as well. Uh, thanks so much for being involved in this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Um, if you are interested in uh, working for Bobby, then go to his website. <laughs> Bobby, what else? If people are listening or watching right now, what could they do for you? I guess it's go and buy the game. Uh, yes, that'd be fantastic. If you have a Quest 2 headset, head to the Oculus store and uh, purchase Zombieland VR. That'd be brilliant. Um, and if you're watching and you're keen to get into the industry, um, you know, when we uh, when we receive applicants and we find the CVs that we've identified and we think look promising, we're going to send them a test. So, you know, always be working on your portfolio, your game, your assets and keep building up those that portfolio, because when you get to an interview, you know, we place a, a very strong emphasis on your password and what that looks like, what's the quality like. So, uh, you know, that'd be the one piece of advice if you are out there and you're looking to get into the industry. Brilliant. Thanks once again. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we will see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Johnny Ross Audio Experience. Thanks so much for joining me. If you want to continue the conversation, head over to my website, fleek.marketing, or find me on LinkedIn. That's all for today. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, tag me in your social media posts, and please leave me a review on iTunes. It will make a huge difference for me. I will see you soon. Bye.